Hi, welcome back to General Chemistry 2. My name is Chuck White, and today we're going to talk about electronic structure of transition metal complexes or coordination complexes. We're going to talk about crystal field theory and the spectrochemical series of ligands. We'll talk about how to measure the magnetic properties of complexes, and we'll talk a little bit about the um, orbital interactions that are taken into account in ligand field theory. Now to start with the simple crystal field theory, we consider the geometric shapes of the five d orbitals as they are oriented along the x, y, and z axes of the system. Now these geometric shapes of the five 3d orbitals do not correspond to the positions of the electron-rich ligands in transition metal complexes. And electron-electron repulsion between the negatively charged ligands and the orbitals on the uh, central metal atom leads to energy differences between the orbitals, or d-orbital splittings. And these splittings are different for each type of structure, either octahedral or tetrahedral or square planar complexes. So as a reminder, the 5d orbitals in the bare metal ion uh, all have the same uh, energy, they're five-fold degenerate. But when you bring six ligands up in an octahedral complex, these five orbitals split into two groups. There's a T2g group of three orbitals that lie in, at lower energy, and an EG group of two orbitals that lie higher in energy. The EG and T2g are just symmetry labels, and you don't have to really worry at this point what they mean. Uh, but the point is that weak field ligands that are, have relatively weak um, ligand metal bonds uh, have a small splitting compared with the amount of energy that's required to pair uh, two electrons in a single orbital. And so uh, what that leads to is high spin uh, complexes where uh, the, elect the orbitals are singly occupied, all five of them, before you start uh, pairing electrons in the T2g orbitals. On the other hand, strong field ligands can cause this splitting between the two groups of orbitals to be large compared with the electron pairing energy. And in that case, uh, after you fill the T2g orbitals with one electron each, the fourth electron actually gets paired in a T2g orbital and the fifth and the sixth before you start putting unpaired electrons in the EG orbitals. For tetrahedral arrangements of four ligands, you have high spin configurations only. And that's because four ligands uh, generally produce a uh, splitting which is small compared with the um, electron pairing energy. In this case of tetrahedral structures, uh, the EG orbitals have lower energy and the T2g orbitals have higher energy, but all of these uh, tetrahedral complexes have high spin configurations. Finally, square, com square planar complexes are important for D8 uh, metal complexes like platinum-2, palladium-2, iridium-1, uh, and uh, gold-3 complexes, and they're always near, almost always low-spin configurations. So here you have dx squared minus y squared orbitals that point directly to the ligands and have the highest energy, the dx, y, z, and d zx orbitals have the lowest energy because those orbitals um, point more away from the ligands and between the axes, and uh, the dz squared and dxy are somewhere in between. So the spectrochemical series is uh, a measure of binding strength and uh, actually the ability to, for ligands to split the uh, orbitals uh, by different magnitudes, and that depends uh, on the binding strength of the ligand. The strong field, field ligands produce um, large uh, splittings between the T2g and EG orbitals, and uh, therefore low spin complexes. And those are typically CN minus CO um, nitrato ligands, and to some extent ethylene diamine ligands, which are abbreviated EN. Weak field ligands, like hydroxide and all of the halide ligands, uh, have relatively small splittings, and um, they have high spin complexes. Now, the small splittings of the weak field ligands um, produce uh, a, an energy difference between the EG and T2g orbitals, which is small. So when uh, a photon is absorbed that promotes an electron from the T2g to the EG orbitals, then um, that typically happens in the red and infrared regions of the spectrum. And so the light that is transmitted, that is to say not absorbed by the complex, uh, appears blue. So these um, uh, kinds of complex 
complexes are colored blue in aqueous solutions typically. Uh, strong field ligands um, produce large splittings and those absorptions occur in the blue and uh, violet and even ultraviolet regions of the spectrum and so red light is transmitted preferentially by those complexes and so many of those complexes with CO and CN minus ligands appear red or orange in color as a result. And so that's the name, that's why this series of ligands gets the name spectro spectrochemical series. Now for things in between, like amine and aqua ligands, water and, and ammonia ligands, uh, you actually have to make a measurement to figure out whether it's high spin or low spin. And uh, that measurement is usually one of magnetic susceptibility. So if all of the electrons are paired, uh, then as shown in the bottom diagram, then you have a low spin configuration and that's diamagnetic. And you'll get a, actually a slight repulsion uh, of an external magnetic field. But in situations that are high spin or paramagnetic, then you have unpaired electrons and those electrons can align themselves north to south with an electronic, with a, an external magnetic field. And they will be attracted to the magnetic field. So by measuring, measuring this attraction or the magnetic susceptibility of the uh, complex, we can estimate the number of unpaired electrons in each uh, molecule or each complex and therefore figure out whether it's high spin or low spin. In the unusual case where you're able to permanently orient the spins, you can make a ferromagnetic material. Most of these are iron or alloys of iron, but recently some uh, organic materials with unpaired electrons have been turned into uh, ferromagnetic materials. Now ligand theory, ligand field theory, takes into account uh, the fact that metal ligand bonds cannot be fully ionic, which is the assumption of uh, crystal field theory. And orbitals on the metal, the 3d, 4s, and 4p orbitals, interact with valence orbitals of the ligand to form orbitals of three type. Uh, three types. There are bonding orbitals, which are mostly ligand in character and mostly occupied. There are antibonding orbitals, which are mostly metal in character and sometimes occupied. And then there are non-bonding orbitals, which are usually a subset of the 3D orbitals and are sometimes partially occupied. So here's an example of a hexaqua titanium 3 complex where you have the metal uh, orbitals on the left hand side, the 3D orbitals, and the unoccupied 4s and 4p orbitals. On the right hand side you have a group of six orbitals from the water molecules, one from each water molecule, that donates uh, electron density into the metal. And that act of donating uh, de helps to delocalize the, these orbitals and lower the kinetic energy of the electrons. So these these six orbitals actually split into uh, three groups, an AG, A1G, T1U, and EG uh, group, and uh, those ligand orbitals are lowered in energy by this delocalization or, or donation process associated with the Lewis acid base interaction. The one electron in the 3D orbital of titanium 3 plus uh, gets uh, translated into a non-bonding T2G orbital, uh, but then the EG orbital, which orbitals, which would also come from the 3D orbitals on the metal, uh, are pushed up in energy because of their repulsive interaction with the ligands. And so this creates a splitting between the T2G and EG orbitals, which is the same splitting that we saw in crystal field theory but now for orbital interaction energy, uh, uh, reasons rather than just Coulombic repulsion reasons. And then the 4s and 4p orbitals form molecular orbitals which lie even higher in energy and, and are antibonding in character, but they're also unoccupied, so that doesn't do us any harm. Ligand field theory can be used to understand backbonding to ligands like CO and CN minus. CO in particular is a sigma donor ligand, um, and this is the ordinary Lewis acid base interaction uh, that you can see uh, at the bottom left where the CO uh, donates uh, electron density directly into the metal, but it's also a pi acceptor ligand, and here you can have electron density that's initially on the metal de delocalized into the pi star orbitals on CO. And so electron density actually flows both ways. The sigma type orbitals flow from the ligand to the metal, the pi type orbitals um, flow from the metal back to the ligand, and all of this delocalization helps to lower the energy of the electrons and the orbitals um, uh, that, that contain them, and so you make a very strong bond with uh, between CO and some metals as a result.
So next time we'll talk about organic chemistry. We'll see you then.